God bless you, church, and welcome back to our study through the letter of Ephesians. And so today we're going to dive into the rest of chapter 2. What we have left is chapter 2, verses 11 through 22. This is going to be titled, Salvation by Grace Continued. Paul just brought us on a wonderful journey explaining uh, the beauty of being saved by grace through faith. Now we're going to see the continuation and the depth of this promise and this hope, and the depth of it goes all the way back through and to the Old Testament of what God did with the nation of Israel, the people of God. So Ephesians chapter 2, starting with verse 11. Therefore remember that formerly you, the Gentiles in the flesh, who were uncircumcised by the so-called circumcision, which is performed in the flesh by human hands, Remember that you were at that time separate from Christ, excluded from the commonwealth of Israel, and strangers to the covenants of promise, having no hope and without God in the world. But now in Christ Jesus, you who formerly were far off, have been brought near by the blood of Christ. For he himself is our peace, who made both groups into one and broke down the barrier of the dividing wall by abolishing in his flesh the enmity, which is the law of commandments contained in ordinances, so that in himself he might make the two into one new man, thus establishing peace and might, uh, and might reconcile them both in one body to God through the cross, by it having put to death the enmity, and he came and preached peace to you who were far away, and peace to those who were near. For through him we both have our access in one spirit to the Father. So then you are no longer strangers and aliens, but you are fellow citizens with the saints or in God's household, having been built on the foundation of the apostles and the prophets, Christ Jesus, himself being the cornerstone in whom the whole building being fitted together is growing into a holy temple of the Lord, in whom you also are being built together into a dwelling of God in the spirit. Let's pray. Father, we thank you for this grace that we have been saved by. And we thank you for your word that's alive and active and that is speaking and communicating your truth, which gives us a better picture of who you are and therefore a better picture of who we are and therefore a better joy and contentment and peace in this life. We pray now that you would illuminate this truth and reality to our hearts by faith and give us courage to live it out. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. So here we see um, the wonderful expression of the Jew and Gentile relationship at the time of writing from the Apostle Paul. Unfortunately, throughout history, and even the history of this country specifically, we've made a gospel, um, a primarily Gentile-centric gospel instead of a Israel-centric or Jewish-centric gospel. Uh but what we see and what we understand in the scripture is that the apostolic foundation and the apostolic understanding of the gospel was a Israel-centric gospel, uh, meaning that God's covenant with Israel and God's covenant with his people um, was, a, was a very important part of God's history and his plan to redeem mankind. And that's why Paul begins and says, Therefore remember that formerly you, the Gentiles in the flesh, who are called uncircumcision by the so-called circumcision, which is performed in the flesh by human hands. So here we see Paul starting this idea or thought or exhortation. And here uh, he's reminding us that Jews clearly held the belief that non-Jews could never share in the fullness of the covenant without being circumcised. We see this in other places in Scripture like Galatians. Paul is going to begin this explanation of the gospel by leveling the playing field for the Jew and Gentile relationship. He states that Jews view Gentiles as those, quote, in the flesh, but Jews ironically are boasting in a circumcision which is accomplished to the flesh, by the flesh, quote, in the flesh. 
So essentially, Paul is speaking against Jewish arrogance before he addresses Gentile arrogance towards the Jew. He's saying that the Jews should not be arrogant towards the Gentile, for circumcision itself is something that is done in the flesh, by the flesh, to the flesh. And so to use that over people and saying this is the real spiritual work of God just doesn't work because, again, it is done in the flesh, by the flesh, to the flesh. Ephesians 2.12 says, Remember that you were at that time separate from Christ, excluded from the commonwealth of Israel, and strangers to the covenants of promise, having no hope and without God in the world. In your wonderful salvation by grace, Paul is saying, don't you dare forget the important foundations. And we can say that again. In your understanding of this wonderful and glorious salvation by grace, if I could say this in all capital letters and shout, I would. Don't you dare forget these important foundations that before this time, what time? The time of Christ, as Hebrew says, right? In the former days, he spoke through. In this day, he spoke through his son. That before this time, the time of Jesus, living, dying, and rising from the dead, we were separated from God. We as Gentiles, as non-Jewish descendants, were excluded from Israel, from salvation. We were strangers and aliens to the covenant of promise, being absolutely without hope. Paul talks about this in Romans eleven seventeen through 22. But if some of the branches were broken off, and you being a wild olive were grafted in among them and became partakers with them of the rich root of the olive tree, do not be arrogant towards the branches. But if you are arrogant, remember that it is not you who supports the root, but the root supports you. You will say then, branches were broken off so that I might be grafted in. Quite right. They were broken off for their unbelief, but you stand by your faith. Do not be conceited, but fear. If God did not spare the natural branches, he will not spare you either. Behold then the kindness and severity of God to those who fell severity, but to you God's kindness. If you continue in his kindness, otherwise you also will be cut off. Paul's understanding of this Jew and Gentile relationship has always been consistent. The Jews were the original people of covenant and promise, and through Jesus Christ, God has grafted us into them, into their salvation, into salvation by grace through faith. And he says, don't you dare be arrogant. Don't you dare forget the history of where you've come from. Don't you dare forget that if God broke off those, some of those branches, he will quickly break off the branches of the quote-unquote Gentiles who profess to have faith but bear no fruit. He continues on in Ephesians 2, 13 and 16. But now in Christ Jesus, you who formerly were far off have been brought near by the blood of Christ. For he himself is our peace, who made both groups into one and broke the barrier of the dividing wall by abolishing in his flesh the enmity, which is the law of commandments contained in ordinances, so that in himself he might make the two into one new man thus establishing peace and might reconcile them both in one body to God through the cross by it having put to death the enmity. Christ, our blessed Savior, became the bridge to salvation for us who believe. And how he now makes us into one covenantal people. He breaks the barrier and invites all people and all nations into the fellowship of Christ with Christ. Paul is writing from prison because he was falsely accused of bringing non-Jews into the temple, Acts 21-28. And this was a law that non-Jews could not go past a certain space in the temple. And if they did, Roman law allowed that person to be severely punished, maybe even executed. 
Paul is speaking in a language that the people would understand. He's saying that dividing wall that separated the Jew, the covenants of promise from the Gentile in the back is abolished in Christ Jesus. And both people, Jew and Gentile, can enter into the holy and spiritual and precious sanctuary and worship the God of Israel, Jesus Christ in the flesh. Ephesians 2, 17 and 19. And he came and preached peace to you who are far away and peace to those who were near. For through him we both have our access in one spirit to the Father. So then you are no longer strangers and aliens, but fellow citizens with the saints and are of God's household. How refreshing is that to hear. What a beautiful identity shift we see. We go from being strangers and aliens to citizens and saints. Praise his holy name. Praise his holy name, strangers and aliens, to citizens and saints. How precious is that reality. In one moment, in in one act, we were far off. We were lost, but now we were found and we were brought close in through the precious blood of Jesus Christ, our Savior. And this is why Paul is getting at the point that there is absolutely no room for Gentile arrogance towards the Jew. For without the Jew, salvation would not be possible for the Gentile. Therefore, on this side of eternity, there is love, respect, prayer, thanksgiving, gratitude, and love, 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 love towards the Jewish people. We honor them for it is because of the faithfulness of the God of Israel, Yahweh, to them that we can stand on the faithfulness of the God of Israel, Jesus, to us today. Glory be to his name. He continues in Ephesians 2, 20 and 21, having been built on the foundation of the apostles and the prophets, Christ Jesus himself being the cornerstone in whom the whole building being fitted together is growing into a holy temple in the Lord, in whom you also are being built together into a dwelling of God in the spirit. Now Paul is bringing this beautiful, complete story of salvation to a head. These teachings through the prophets of the old and the apostles of Paul's day come together for a coherent, beautiful, flawless story and reality. The beauty of the majesty is a foundation, but the foundation will not be held together without the most precious peace— the cornerstone, Jesus Christ. Christ became the peace that held together this foundation of the prophets and now the proclaiming apostles built on the cornerstone, the bedrock of Jesus Christ, who without him would not hold together. His work, his blood, his story, his fulfillment is the cornerstone that holds up our salvation together in which we build up through faith. That is why the Apostle Peter, he kind of brings this out even further in 1 Peter 2, 5, and 10. You also as living stones are built up as a spiritual house, a royal priesthood to offer up spiritual sacrifices acceptable to God through Christ. For this is contained in Scripture. Behold, I lay in Zion a choice stone, a precious cornerstone, and he who believes in him will not be disappointed. This precious value then is for you who believe, but for those who disbelieve, the stumbling stone, the stone which the builders rejected has become the very cornerstone and a stone of stumbling and a rock of offense for they stumble because they are disobedient to the word and to this doom they were appointed. But you are a chosen race, a royal priesthood, a holy nation, a people of God's own possession that you might proclaim the excellencies of him who's called you out of darkness into his marvelous light. For you were once not a people, but now you are the people of God. You had not received mercy, but now you have received mercy. Now this beautiful grafting in is, 
our worship of Yahweh, Jesus, is a significant sign to the rest of the world that the God of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob is our God. We are not a chosen race, a royal priesthood, a holy people. A nation, a people for his own possession without the work of Jesus Christ. This testifies to the world now because of his work. It testifies to the world, to the nations, and to the powers of the air that we can freely serve God and worship him in the spirit because of the cornerstone, that we now have full access and we are one in him. No race, no titles, no eth- ethnicity distinctions are necessary we are all one in him being built up into a spiritual house for spiritual worship which is why paul says in philippians 3 3 for we are the true circumcision who worship in the spirit of god and glory in christ jesus and put no confidence in the flesh Paul here, as a Jew, is associating himself with this one covenant people. We are the true circumcision. There is one covenant people who believe in God through faith. This moves us to worship God in the spirit and put no confidence in the flesh. Paul had much confidence. He could have been glorying in all of his confidence But the playing field for salvation was leveled at the cross where Jew and Gentile came to this one saving faith. Beloved, this is not replacement theology where we say the church replaces Israel. This is the continuation of God's covenant people that was all the way from the beginning as Romans talks about. By faith, those by faith who believe in God, the God of the Bible, Yahweh, Jesus Christ of Nazareth, those who have placed faith in him and now in this day at the finished work of the cross are grafted into his covenant people by grace through our faith. The salvation is ours and therefore we have no confidence in the flesh. We have no arrogance towards the Jewish people, but we simply love God and worship him by the spirit. And as the word says, a true believer will provoke the Jew to jealousy. The true believer will provoke the true Gentile even to jealousy as we live in such a way that is pleasing to the Lord. Bless his holy name. Let's turn now to our small group leaders and continue this wonderful dialogue through the letter to the church at Ephesus.